And we're going to take you now into the next session titled Dynamics of Detroit's Startup Community. Endeavor, for those that may not be familiar with the organization, um, Endeavor was founded in 1997 and we work with a very specific type of entrepreneur. We work with companies that are scaling. We work with really high growth companies. We're working with companies that are growing at least 20 to 30% a year and some much more than that. We're working with companies that are on a path to 50, 100 million in revenue if you're on the, the, the smaller side uh, of the companies. And we're also working with companies that are maybe much larger than that. But then the question is, can you 10x your revenue? Um, the other part that's really, really important for us is really working with entrepreneurs that have a pay it forward mentality. And that is critical for what we're trying to build. We're now helping some entrepreneurs scale and build their companies to large organizations so that, that when they become really successful, they can come back, they can join Endeavor's leadership, they can join other organizations and give back and multiply their impact through the success that they've had by reinvesting their knowledge and capital in the ecosystem and the startups and the scale-ups and the businesses that will grow and drive economic growth in Michigan. Uh, since we started in Detroit, and this was about four, four years ago, uh, we've added 16 companies uh, that are part of Endeavor Detroit and we cover the whole state of Michigan. These companies, since our inception, are growing on a compounded rate about 46%. Um, hopefully we can keep those numbers. Those are actually pretty high, even from a, a global standard for Endeavor. And in our, a larger context, uh, Endeavor is now in 34 different countries. We have 1,500 companies, 1,900 entrepreneurs almost that are part of Endeavor uh, for a combined revenue of about 20 billion um, and about 2 million jobs by all of these companies. And what's really interesting, high, high growth entrepreneurs, they do need a little different type of support. Uh, we offer them access to networks, some education, a lot of mentorship, founder to founder relationships, access to capital, access to talent, and because we are in all of these markets, certainly access to, to these markets and networks. Um, our mentors are able to share their experiences with entrepreneurs on how to expand, on how to scale, and how to build their enterprises domestically and globally. Um, move on to the presentation. So for the study, we, we really wanted to understand how to really have an economic impact by supporting companies on scaling. Uh, so we asked ourselves three questions. How do entrepreneurs reach scale at their companies? How do entrepreneurs reach scale in local networks and ecosystems? And what can policymakers, philanthropic leaders, investors, support organizations, and other stakeholders do to empower more entrepreneurs to reach scale in our own communities? Endeavor completed the study and looks kind of what are the advantages of Southeast Michigan in regards to these three questions. While the ecosystem in Southeast Michigan uh, has improved a great deal in the last decade, uh, the community has capacity of obviously for much more improvement. Uh, startups and businesses and relocation and attraction strategies play a really valuable role in economic development. But the ability of each to dramatically improve job creation and economic growth is limited. The report examines how a specific category of businesses impact both the economy and the communities we live and shows how local entrepreneurs who have built their companies and have reached scale are among the most valuable economic assets in any community. From the findings of the report, uh, we can see that Southeast Michigan faces a number of persist persistent um, economic challenges. A significant percentage of local jobs, and if we add the last two bottom bars there, that represents about 46%, uh, are in industries that are projected to shrink or are growing slower than, than average uh, in the US. The region also remains overly dependent in a single sector, as many of us know, the automotive industry, uh, which exposes our residents to greater economic volatility than they would exist if we had a more diversified economy. Um, Southeast Michigan needs to create higher paying jobs and become less reliant on declining industries. Thank you. So from the report, we also looked at the most proper cities in the US. And one of the things that we found in a quality that separates them from other metropolitan areas are the greater number of entrepreneurial companies with 50 or more employees in high value industries. 
These locally owned high growth companies pay employees 20% more in average wages than smaller firms do. They generate 40 times more in revenue on average. Um, in a relative size, Southeast Michigan has about 20 to 60% more of these larger high value entrepreneurial companies than the rest of the country. So from this slide, you, you can pretty much see the correlation that, that is established by these high value entrepreneurial companies with both DGP and then income per capita. So this slide looks at the six industries that we found and we categorized them, but behind each of the, the, the choices of words that we, we have, there are NAICS codes uh, in the report that actually have a lot more industry codes that represent each one of these industries. And the, the thing that I'd like to point out only on this slide is really when you look at the, the dynamism area, um, it really is talking about the proportion of these larger high value entrepreneurial companies um, that were founded in the last decade here in Michigan. So this is, this is kind of what we found and some things that we might be able to learn from. Avoid the myths of quantity. So while relocation incentives and support for other small businesses can play useful holds in the economy, like we've mentioned, um, it can be limited. Simply doing more of these activities is unlikely to dramatically improve job creation and increase economic growth. Rather than following the myths of quantity, assuming that simply doing more of the current activities will always be beneficial, Decision makers should consider the importance of quality as they develop strategies for our future. This can help ensure that limited resources or that some of that limited resources for local economic development is dedicated and can be dedicated to companies that will offer the greatest results for our region. Focus on scale. The importance of fostering growth is clear in Southeast Michigan. Companies that reach the size of 50 or more employees make only 10% of our companies but they account for 75, 74 to 75% of the jobs in our community. Data also indicates that if Southeast Michigan could create 60 new larger high value entrepreneur companies, it would increase our GDP by approximately or just under 2% or $5 billion. This growth will also increase the average income for our 4.7 million residents by about $1,200. Through growing the economic or through growing the entrepreneurial companies, are, are, though growing entrepreneurial companies can be powerful, they're, in, they're all, they're, sorry, they're now as well supported types of businesses in our community. The New Economy Initiative uh, recently conducted an analysis of more than 100 entrepreneurship based organizations for a report that will be released in June. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> These analyses reveal that while this is a board, uh, a, there's a broad support for ideation and early, start, and early stage entrepreneurs in Southeast Michigan, few local organizations are really currently targeting the founders of growing and scaling companies for assistance. Three, follow the lead of local successful entrepreneurs. Local entrepreneurs who have built large companies are among the most valuable economic resources in our community. Data compiled from founders in Southeast Michigan indicates that there are six types of large, high-value entrepreneurial companies, as we, we saw on the previous slide. Entrepreneurial companies that provide competitive advantage in entrepreneurship. Decision makers should follow the lead of local founders operating these businesses and offer them tailored support while also providing general assistance to companies in high other high-value sectors. Civic leaders in Southeast Michigan can learn a great deal from founders of larger high value entrepreneurial companies, but in order to do so, they must listen to them. Decision makers should bring together groups of these founders, ideally organized by industry, to hear, them the, to hear from them and discuss the challenges that slow the growth of their own businesses. They should also continue to evaluate data in the region to identify when types of high entrepreneurial companies arise within our community. And four, build networks around the best of the best local entrepreneurs. The stories of founders at large high value entrepreneur companies profiled in this report demonstrate the value that successful entrepreneurs can provide to upcoming companies. By acting as mentors, investors, 
and sharing their knowledge with the next generation of entrepreneurs. When entrepreneurs who have built companies that reach scale support upcoming founders, it significantly increases the likelihood of success for these local businesses. Decision makers should build networks around the founders to help them share their knowledge, social connections, financial capital with the upcoming entrepreneurs. These networks can be constructed in several ways, by facilitating individual connections like mentoring and early stage investing, by including successful founders in leadership positions at organizations that support local entrepreneurship, and by enlisting these founders in efforts to improve the local entrepreneurship community and work toward common goals such as increasing inclusion. Developing networks like these that encourage a virtual cycle of entrepreneurial support is one of the best ways leaders can help new, larger, high-value entrepreneurial companies to thrive in our ecosystem. So Pam, before you, you comment and tell a little Thank bit you. more about New Economy Initiative, um, I just want to point out on the tables, there's an executive summary of the report. Um, Antonio, where can we get the full report? Yes, <laughs> we can get the full report. We have a, we'll have a link, we have a link on our website. Yep. Um, the report was generated and, and filed after we had the handouts done. Yep. Um, but we can have, perhaps have the, the whole address for you in just a little bit. I, and, can, I can tell you by the end. And just a little advertisement, Sherry Welch did a great story on this in Cranes, Detroit. <clears throat> if you read it online, there's a link in the first couple right. paragraphs to the full report. So I encourage you to check that out. You'll be seeing um, more things through other sources and other channels uh, as well. So um, Pam, sorry, uh, go ahead. This is fun. I'm not usually the responder in a panel. <laughs> Uh, usually I'm in Antonio's position, so good job. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for being with us today. So those of you who don't know, New Economy Initiative, also known as NEI, is a philanthropic effort started 12 years ago to support entrepreneurship. We basically, uh, not basically, because it is kind of hard work, but we make strategic grants to organizations like a Michigan Women's Forward or an Endeavor or MIBA or Build Institute, Tech Town. Uh, so that they can support entrepreneurs. And so this report is um, very important because so often we, when we think about entrepreneurship in this region, to me there's two schools of thought. Either people go straight to the tech entrepreneur, they talk about Doug Song, they talk about you know, Tony Brzezanowski and Ann Arbor, which are, who are great entrepreneurs um, and their exits and what's happening with them or they go to our small neighborhood businesses, uh, which are also equally as important. And sometimes this high growth scalable group, if they're not necessarily innovation led or tech driven, get lost in the shuffle. And I think it's important to recognize that this high growth group is adding to the economy in a significant way. I think the point that I wanted to raise too was that, um, and often when reports like this come out, you know, then we kind of log, 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 you know, grab onto, oh, this is it, this is our path. I just want to make sure that these are all and strategies. I mean, I was talking to Dan Radomski, who runs LTU Collaboratory earlier this morning, and he was talking about the high growth opportunity that comes from these social enterprises. Yep. And so you have, you know, this, this group of work that is creating jobs, they're creating diverse jobs, they're creating opportunity for residents uh, in a lot of cases that uh, can go to those jobs where they live. But I don't want us to lose sight of the work of the neighborhood small businesses and also that they're not mutually exclusive. That was another oh, point. You know, we were talking about this a lot too. A lot of times we compartmentalize small businesses, we got the small business lane over here, we got the high growth lane here, we got the tech folks over here, we got the social entrepreneurship here, as if they don't all you know, intertwine. And there's a powerful link between the small business, that neighborhood business and the growth business, if those businesses have the opportunity to see that they have a pathway to grow. Uh, in a lot of cases, that's not the case. So for example, I don't know if you guys saw the legacy panel. Who saw that? All five of you. Well, it was a great, it was a great <laughs> panel. You missed it. You you really should you really should stream it because it really speaks to what Antonio's talking about. Uh, these are non-automotive sector, high growth companies, right? You know, Art Van, Bartech, and Am Amway. You know, commercial products, staffing and, and consulting services, 
and furniture, <laughs> furniture and retail, of course. I have it in my house. Um, but the point is that they all talked about how they started small. I mean, you know, 4,000 square feet that Art Van Elslander had that now is 180 stores. You know, Cindy Paskey probably had five employees one day. Bill Picard actually started owning McDonald's franchises, right? And so making that link between the value of supporting neighborhood small business and providing pathways for them to become these growth businesses so that they can create these outcomes is so important. And the other thing that I'll mention and then I'll stop talking is also the, the need to make sure that there are points of entry that are equitable for all types of entrepreneurs. You know, and so when we're talking about entrepreneurship, we used to always tease and say, close your eyes and imagine an entrepreneur, what does he look like? You know? <laughs> um, but, but you know, entrepreneur com entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes. And so the work that we've been doing, funded by philanthropy, is trying to make sure that those access points to a network of support are equitable. That there's organizations like community development corporations that are working with neighborhood entrepreneurs that are helping them find their way. There are organizations like Michigan Women's Foundation working with women. So that's all important to us, too. Um, I think of the Entrepreneur Color Fund, which serves this particular group that Kellogg and J.P. Morgan Chase and others have funded. And so these are all important things, but I, I guess my big response is, you know, you know, now that you know, the Detroit Regional Partnership Group is, is starting up too, there's business attraction, there's small business entrepreneurship, there's high growth entrepreneurship, yes. There's social entrepreneurship, yes, and, and, and. And so these are and strategies, not or strategies. And they all work together to grow an economy and make it strong. Absolutely. Jason, tell us about Vectorform sure. and what of these, uh, what of the research and the findings and recommendations resonate for you? Yeah, sure, Darren. So for those of you who do not know, uh, Vectorform is a digital innovation and digital product development company. So we started uh, in downtown Detroit 20 years ago. My business partner and I, Kurt Steckling, um, started this company and our goal is really to transform the way that companies do business. So we leverage the emerging technology to work with companies like Google, Microsoft, Intel, Walt Disney to really fundamentally change the way they do business, interact with their customers um, all throughout um, Detroit, Michigan. And, uh, you know, after uh, some time, you know, it was, it was definitely a, a passion business. My father was an architect and um, built amazing research facilities that really transformed business. So, mm -hmm. so this was something that was really important to me. But when we apply technology, we could see the scale effect that this could have when transforming companies. So, you know, but our business was really passionate about it. It was about how do we take this great technology and really transform a business. And, you know, having the opportunity to meet an organization like Endeavor where it's like, hey, you guys could really go beyond just, you know, this single model. There's a, there's a different model. And working with Antonio and his team, you know, Vectorform not only invents digital products and experiences, but we invent digital businesses. So we have five scale-up companies that we've developed, um, Kurt and I, and uh, it's been a fantastic ride, and it's mm -hmm. been very exciting. And <clears throat> in terms of, you know, the report, well, I, I want to first, you know, obviously thank the William Davidson Foundation for commissioning this report. I mean, we all know that the startup ecosystem is important, but, you know, how do we how do we grow it? How, mm -hmm. What are what are some of the problems? I mean, the reality of the situation is we are lacking in this state um, compared to other states in terms of our our entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I think the report does a great job in terms of understanding what are the tactics, and more importantly, um, how can we be intentional about some of the moves and ecosystems that we can develop to really support this. Um, you know, Antonio, you, you said stakeholders, and I, and I and I like that word a lot. Um, when we talk about stakeholders, so let me ask you a quick question. How many entrepreneurs are in the room right now? That's great. What about um, people that have friends or family who are entrepreneurs? Okay, wow, that's awesome. Um, so here's the reality of the situation. You know, in the report, I think my favorite part was the statistic. It said that um, 60 scale-up companies will add five billion in GDP growth we will all benefit from that as indirect and direct stakeholders. So I see that as um, you know, something that's really inspiring and, mm -hmm. and really shows the importance of why we need to take the findings of this report and activate against it. Got it. So Antonio, I have a follow-up question. And for those of you who may have questions in the audience, just raise your hand and a staff member will come with a mic. Um, 
But Antonio, you've talked just briefly about the importance of entrepreneurs basically giving back. And Jason, you talked about the support that you're getting from yeah. Endeavor. So Antonio, what are you hoping Jason does in the future to support the entrepreneurial yeah. ecosystem? Or more broadly speaking, what are you hoping entrepreneurs uh, that are successful, uh, how can they give back to the community? So we had this conversation this morning, and he's joining our board soon. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the path to that, and that's the idea, right? I think what, what really makes Endeavor a founder to founder, an entrepreneur to entrepreneur organization, first, is a little bit of time. We were founded with amazing board members. As we develop and grow, more of these board members will hopefully become Endeavor entrepreneurs that take the leadership of the organization forward. Endeavor Argentina, for example, which I mentioned was one of our first offices, I think 70% of our board members uh, are former Endeavor entrepreneurs. Uh, one leading Mercado Libre, which is probably a 20 billion market cap company right now, and a couple of them that are on the board are part from Globant, which is close to 2 billion in market cap right now, and who actually actually did not make it through the first phase of the selection process with Endeavor. Um, I think the, the other big part, and, and Jason and Kurt already do that, is mentor and help other entrepreneurs that are up and coming before them or a little bit earlier in their careers that they are. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important. And also try can continue to think about not how to just mentor and transfer their knowledge, but the access to capital, is, is, it, it, it is a gap that we have. And how can it be better than having entrepreneurs that believe in other entrepreneurs investing in them? So being able to facilitate and help that and augment that is a big portion of what we hope our entrepreneurs in the future can do locally and what's happening already throughout the globe. I agree, man. It's, it's one of those things where one of the first times that Kurt and I you know, got advice, it's like, we're getting free consulting. You don't have to pay for this. It seemed, it seemed not real. And it becomes contagious. It's like, wow, this, we just dodged a massive dump truck heading for us. Thank you so much. And you, you feel the need to return that favor in any way that you can. So mm -hmm. it's sort of this cyclical uh, behavioral pattern that's very strong specifically in, in Michigan that I'm really excited about. Uh, so I just want to maybe connect some dots or maybe retell the story that I'm hearing just in case yeah. uh, I'm missing something and yeah. maybe this will be helpful for the, the group in the audience and I'm still waiting for uh, the first question. I don't know if somebody has a mic. Okay, Gabe, we'll get to you, you in a second. But um, what I heard was basically th that there's a lot of attention that we pay to making sure that we have a vibrant startup community you know, yeah. and the yeah. support systems in place for that. And uh, we as a region have been doing better and better thanks to the work of New Economy Initiative yeah. and others. Um, uh, we do spend a lot of time talking about the Amazons, trying to attract them, or, uh, and that's an important element of our strategy for economic development. But to Pam, your point, it needs to be an and, an and, an and strategy. And what you're pointing out, Antonio, is this opportunity to focus on the mid-sized local entrepreneur-led companies, and not only because they help drive job growth, but because you can get this sort of cyclical effect of the founders of those companies getting to the point where they are in a position to mentor the next, um, the next startup right. entrepreneur. Yeah. Did I get that right? I couldn't have said it better. I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, also think, I also think it's in addition to mentoring, too. I mean, I guess I was blown away by the, the legacy panel, but I also think about other entrepreneurs in this community. It also is this notion of generation, generational wealth and what that does to their own families, but then how do they invest that back in the community? Exactly. Mm. I mean, each of those gentlemen at the last panel talked about their, first of all, they talked about their mothers and fathers and the fact that the fathers got all the credit, but the mothers were right alongside the fathers, mm -hmm. helping them build the business. Note that, okay, so they <laughs> talked about that. But, they, but in each of their stories, they talk, each one of those founders were invested heavily back into, you know, Ypsilanti and Detroit with, with the Barfield family. You know, we all know the work that the Van Landers have done. So I think this whole notion of reciprocity is so important. Um, and of course, you know, me on the input side, I also think that whole notion of inclusion, because the more diversity you have creating that general wealth, right, the more diversity you have in terms of the give back to the communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, right. if I may add one other concept that's really, really important to us is, is kind of the role model, right? Being able to interact and see others that have done it before mm -hmm. who are pushing you to think bigger mm -hmm. about your business, about your community, uh, is very, very powerful. Um, the, I think the best example I have was uh, Jason Wank was with us at a, a gala dinner in, in New York with Endeavor. 
Um, and Marcos Gasparin from Mercado Libre was speaking and talking about his trajectory, how he joined Endeavor and everything, but yeah. the company and how he built it. And he's like, right, literally right after the, 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 the speech, he, he comes to me and said, I'm thinking too small. I'm, I, need to, I need to figure out how to grow this company to a billion, maybe 10 billion and, and, and keep going. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's hard to pinpoint. That's not a metric that, that, that you can really easily measure. It's very soft, mm -hmm. but it's very powerful. Right. Yeah. So let's go to the audience. Gabe, you're first. Thank you. Uh, hi, Gabe Rodriguez, Detroit Regional Partnership. So I just wanted to uh, ask a question on the, the data, the research. I've, I've seen some of it in depth, and I really think it's really great work. What's the next steps for Endeavor NEI? How are you leveraging this to focus in on these areas, identify leaders in this space? What is, uh, talk, if you could explain a little more about how you're planning on using this. Anybody specific for the question? That's a hard one. I think I'll give it to Pam. <laughs> I'll get the hard one. I'm the girl in the group. Yeah. Um, I can handle it. Oh. No. But in, anyway, <laughs> I couldn't can, can help it. Anyone who knows me knows that I just can't help, <laughs> help those moments. No, there's a lot of things going on. So you have, so like uh, Darren mentioned, NEI just finished a huge asset scan body of work where we've um, spent a couple of months really understanding what are all the different support services that are helping entrepreneurs in the region, startup to existing businesses, innovation led to small business. And so we have that body of work. That body of work also spoke to how are these organizations networked together and how are they connecting. What it doesn't tell you necessarily is the relevance of, that, of those assets to the needs of the entrepreneurs. But we have to start somewhere, so we have that. We also understand now kind of the emerging industries that are, that are serving, but we also have client data that also mirrors some of what they're saying, but also other industry sectors that are you know, being made available. You're doing work that. So we feel like it's really important for us to start better coordinating all these studies that we're doing so that we can truly begin to understand, because there's been a lot of money invested in support services, right? Yeah. And we have a lot of data on activity and how capital is moving and who's getting it. But we really need to do a better job at understanding what isn't here. Where are the real gaps? What needs aren't happening? And the thing that we haven't done, that I'm gonna out all of us in this room that are supporting entrepreneurs, I think we haven't done well enough, is actually asking the entrepreneur mm -hmm. directly. You know, and really kind of talking to the entrepreneur that either is using the services that philanthropy is funding or aren't using the services that philanthropy is funding to find out what are those true gaps and what's missing and how can we help accelerate growth for some and create access to opportunity for others. I don't know if I answered your question. So, so I want to avoid asking the entrepreneur to my right and go to <laughs> Antonio just as a follow-up question. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, which is, uh, you did identify these six sectors, yeah. sort of high value industries. How much does Endeavor's portfolio of companies reflect like those that. sectors? Um, it, it does the finding that there, there are these six sectors change uh, your work in any way? And we'll get to you, Jason. Yeah. So yes to both questions, actually. So we we're, we're definitely have companies in all those sectors, um, heavily in actually all those sectors. To me, I, I came a little bit more from the tech background with our friends here from MNDC, Fred and Paula uh, at the time, uh, and was really surprised by what we have going on, specifically in food and beverage. The other ones were, were a little bit more obvious to me. Uh, but food and beverage was, we have like three or four companies in food and beverage in our 16 okay. companies. So a fourth of our portfolio is, is really food and beverage and, and scaling fast. Okay. Um, I think that's a, a huge opportunity. And, and to answer a little bit of, of Gabe's question too, I wasn't trying to deflect that. I was just, she knows a lot. Um, it's I think for us what it means, it's, it's really bringing the context of the local market for us, which was really, really important. We know a lot of the elements through Endeavor that can help entrepreneurs scale. It's, I think it's a good direction to start understanding like, okay, so we're seeing food and beverage companies. Should we really try and support them? Should, like, how, how do you really analyze what you're seeing on your pipeline? And to be honest, in the beginning for us, it's like we're just trying to get the best companies and we're not even thinking portfolio strategy or who we're helping. We're really like looking for the quality and the quality established for us at a global level. So Kurt and, and Jason had to go to an international selection panel and in their case in, in Madrid to get selected into Endeavor. Only 2.9% of the companies that go through the Endeavor process get selected. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a rigorous process. Uh, but again, I think that the direction that it changed is, is first, it starts shedding the light on some of the industries uh, that we should consider as industries that we have a competitive advantage and figure ways to support. And some of them, I, other than some of our programs, it's very hard to think about support organizations like consulting firms. Like I, I, I my ignorance, I, sorry, I don't know any supporting organizations that, that really help consulting companies. Is there something that we should do here or not? I think it starts driving a conversation that we haven't had before. And I think that to me is one of the most important parts of it. And then the local context for Endeavor. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know we had a, a question in the back, but Pam, you wanted to I just wanted to with... pinpoint the okay. food and beverage conversation because I want to make a connection of why this particular sector is very important, particularly in a city like yeah. Detroit. So you take, you know, 60% of Detroiters leave Detroit to go to work, right? Uh, to find suitable jobs, unfortunately. <laughs> So here's a cool story. So you have McClure's Pickles, right? That is an, uh, a company that's come through Endeavor. That's a, you all know who McClure's Pickles is. <laughs> in the west side of Detroit with a factory employing Detroiters. And then you have Ellis Island T, Niall Ellis Brown, a young African-American woman, a very young <laughs> woman, who is doing uh, organic tea, who now has moved into the McClure's old building, so they are now neighbors. In the west side of Detroit, high growth companies, she's all in Sam's Clubs, all over the country, he's all over the country. They're probably employing about 150 people between them, if not more, my number's probably wrong. A high percentage of those people are Detroiters that now don't have to go out of Detroit to get suitable jobs. This is the value of those high growth companies, and that's the importance of food. Now the next frontier is how to get those jobs over $20 an hour, but we're not going there. But <laughs> But anyway, but that's just a dot connection of the importance of, of that sector to a community like Detroit. Great, so I'm gonna turn more attention to the audience here because I've seen a number of hands going up with questions up here, but in the backs. Hey, uh, Darren, Dan Wyant, Edward Lowe Foundation. Hi, Dan. I, I really appreciate this topic. And my question is specifically this. Um, I really love the end or strategies, um, startups, uh, growth companies, uh, attraction, place-based work, all important. Um, how do you, to the whole panel, do you feel that economic developers and communities recognize the differentiation between startups and growth companies and their value? And if not, what can we do to help communicate that better? <laughs> I, All right, Antonio. I, oh, I, sorry. You know, let's <laughs> ask Gabe. No. <laughs> I, I'm going to just speak my opinion. Because yeah. I am not an economic development expert. I am a grant maker I'm in either. philanthropy. But from what I can tell, and I'm looking at Fred, too, from MEDC, I'm not exactly sure everyone puts them all as, in terms of their value to the, to the economy in the same level. And I think they should be. I think there is, when you look at how the money flows, there seems to be more and, and of course, if people are counting jobs, you know, if you, if you pull in a big company here, flexed, flexing gate, um, and the, the things that the mayor talked about, those are, those are large numbers and that's great, right? But if you can't get those jobs, sometimes there's entrepreneurship out of necessity. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that people are eating, feeding their families, and creating a worth ec ethic that teaches their household something different and provides a way of life so they can get out of this Alice category, poverty category. That's just as valuable, right? And so I don't, I don't think the value is the same because if you follow the money, it just doesn't feel the same. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the proper understanding of the taxonomy might not be there, but the understanding that companies create jobs always is. I think 10 or 15 years ago, the conversation around startups was very, very small. Um, especially in our state. Scale-ups wasn't even a term, or high growth, or gazelle, or however you want to call it. Uh, I think being able to, just, just because now we have these terms, it is, it, it is some progress. I think there, are, there, there is the need for distinction because if you're able to identify the needs of, the specific needs of each of these categories, you'll be able to support them better. And I truly believe 100% what Pam has said, we need all of them. Uh, but the more we know how to support them individually with potentially different programs, organizations, I think the better off we'll be. Mm -hmm. Great, we have a question in the middle. Thanks, uh, Dan Radomski, I'm with Lawrence Tech. We run a hardware accelerator for the state of Michigan. And this is more of a clarifying question. Um, the six areas that <clears throat> you focused on, and I imagine they were pulled by NAICS codes, 
consulting firms, does that include design and engineering consulting firms? Mm. I suspect it. Altera is one of our examples. Yeah, so I, I think this is a really important point because there was other data points, mm -hmm. uh, and it's really easy to, to lose sight of some of the important things. The data that you showed, it, the decline in manufacturing jobs, we have to, we can't overlook the design and engineering jobs associated with physical product manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Just because manufacturing may not be happening here in Michigan or even the U.S., um, some of the highest growth companies that you're talking about, whether it's a company I used to work with at Optimal, or it's big companies like Ricardo and ABL, they are doing the design, the engineering validation, the testing, all of the prototyping, all the high value mm -hmm. product development for physical product manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So that's something we're best in class in. I don't care if we're, we're product development for automotive applications, medical, consumer devices, the world turns to us, we're best in class. Mm -hmm. And I don't want us to ever forget that that product development value chain here is critical to maintain and value. Thank you. Yeah. Getting a lot of nodding heads here. Okay, in the back, George? Yeah, George, hi. Yeah. So I know this wasn't really the focus of your topic, um, but when you talk about a healthy entrepreneurial ecosystem mm. and you talk about startups, the very term startups makes it sound like that's where it starts. <laughs> but I'd like you to comment about the importance of invention, innovation, entrepreneurial learning for mm. youth, mm. which seems to me is really the wellhead of the talent pipeline you guys all want to mm -hmm. uh, deal with. Yeah, I, I can certainly cover that. So. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, startups, you know, when, uh, when Kurt and I were, were getting going and we quit our, you know, fancy jobs, uh, you know, our, our family friends were like, did you get a job yet, you know, um, thinking we, it was just a hobby what we were doing. And, you know, it is, there's a lot of challenges, but number one, I would say it's, it's talent. And I can talk all day about things that we need to do, and I think the report really addresses a lot of tactics here as well. But, you know, talent's a long game. And you absolutely have to be invested in looking at ways that we can engage youth. Chris Marshall is doing a fantastic job um, with some of the work that she's doing with Winning Futures to really mentor the next generation. Uh, there's all sorts of things that at Vectorform we're doing, engaging robotics programs, working with uh, grade school children to get them excited about technology, uh, to get all people excited about technology. It's interesting that you know, we typically see, you know, men who are very excited about uh, uh, science and engineering and STEM, if you will. But the reality of the situation is that, um, you know, if you look at the research, many, um, many people, uh, men specifically, are great at science and engineering and nothing else, whereas many women who are good at science and engineering are good at everything else, so they have other options. So how do we now choose to sort of encourage and excite people about, hey, come work in technology and innovation, build the next AI platform. Um, so it is the long game. You have to engage the youth. It's about education, it's about exposure. Uh, a third of Vectorform's office is dedicated to community engagement and how do we bring schools and how do we bring people in to show them what the future is and what's possible. Great. I, I'd like to add to that too because our work at NEI has primarily been adult focused, but under the leadership of Maria, Maria is sitting right there, Lalonde, um, we've been really exploring kind of this connection between our work and how to create opportunities for young people to get exposed to the entrepreneurial ecosystem that we've been funding. If you think about what has happened in this country around sports and how people use sports as leadership training and you know, team building, uh, we really think there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity to lift up entrepreneurship in that same way. Critical thinking, problem solving, ideation, you know, so whether you're going to start a business or whether you're going to make grants, whether you're going to, you know, be an engineer or a foundation leader, these are still good skills. And so she's been leading work with a cohort of, of, of adult-based entrepreneurial programs and people that have pipelines to youth. So Detroit Area Pre-College Engineering Program, DAPSEP, uh, which I actually went through as a kid, which got me interested in engineering. Hmm. Um, uh, to Robotics is a sport now too. So See, there yeah. you go. So here's the point. So, so we're, we're doing is we're saying we're looking at a tech town and working with them to connect them with how to engage and expose youth. Looking at what LTU is doing and they're bringing children from churches and their community to get exposed to entrepreneurship. 
So we think it's very important, but you're right, Jason, it is a long game. I mean, the work that you guys have been doing at the Henry Ford for years. If I might, uh, as we speak, we have over 550 third through 12th graders at Henry Ford Museum over the next two days who are involved in invention, convention, yeah, competitive amazing. activities. And um, we have over 2,000 people because it's uh, their families, it's their teachers, et cetera. And these are kids grades three through 12 uh, who compete. They, in order to compete in the nationals that we host, they already have to have won their, their local, regional, or state competitions. We have the best of the best, and that's an activity that will continually be played out at the Henry Ford for now into yeah, the future. Yeah, it's amazing it's awesome. work. Thank you for that. We have a question or comment up front here. Uh, yes, my name is David Broner. I'm a volunteer at SCORE. So when I saw the topic, Dynamics of Detroit Startup Community, I love what Antonio and Jason are doing, but many of the people that we're coaching didn't have a dad who was an architect that inspired them to do whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. Many of them didn't have a neighbor who was in business or knew an attorney, knew an accountant. So a lot of the people that we're talking to are coming from a different place. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that you have this, the idea of this peer group uh, co-mentoring is helpful. We're trying to do these round tables where similar businesses are sitting around a table of sharing best practices. But building back the communities in the city of Detroit is a little bit different. And um, it's, it's really ground level and holding people's hands and coaching them and getting, getting them to the next level. But it's, scaling is not a word that I would be using, especially in the first six months of coaching somebody. But it's just different than I was expecting the panel to be talking about. Yeah, I yeah. think we, we needed to finalize the title before all of the content was set. So there may be a disconnect here. Sorry for any false advertising, no, so, but glad that you're here. Yeah, but you raise a good point. I mean, that was the point I was making in terms of these different points of entry and how do you create networks of support that allow any person to enter in and be able to take that idea into a business that can employ somebody. Because we all got dreams. Everybody has dreams. Mm -hmm. In the back there. Hi, uh, my name is Damian Perkari. I'm the director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office on, uh, in Detroit. Um, and I started, I was going to start with a question on opportunity zones, but I, I just wanted to um, let you know that the Patent and Trademark Office did a study on inventorship and gender um, and found that um, in general the country is lacking in the number of women inventors we have and Michigan is very lacking in the number of women inventors we have yeah. and we're just studying the issue right now we don't have any solutions or recommendations but there's an enormous opportunity like uh, the mayor identified earlier today there's an enormous opportunity for inventions by women that are just not being captured through the patent system my question for the panel and the group and perhaps the room is did the Tax Act and jobs creation law that went into effect about uh, two years ago have any impact? Um, are opportunities zones that were part of the act causing businesses to relocate or to locate in areas that provide very significant advantages? Do you know that, Don? I'm I can, not sure. Don I can talk a little bit about opportunity that. zones for yeah. the very little that I know, but the regulation opportunity zones really came through like two or three months ago. Yeah. Very few people really know how to enact or take advantage of it yet. The two years that you're referring to is not necessarily the time frame in which it started. Uh, so hopefully I will. I, I, I've heard and had some conversations regarding opportunity zones here, um, including with uh, Jonathan. Um, I think it's early to see, I think it's a hope, but from, from promos that I've seen or, or, or heard before, it seems there's a lot of potential. The, the issue of having the regulation come so late and now having a very short time to take the full opportunity of the credits, um, I'm not sure how that's gonna play off. Great, uh, question or comment, yep. Yeah, Mark Brookie from Lawrence Tech. So I love all your four bullet points, the, the um, Thank you, Mark. Uh, focus, scale, uh, but I'm really curious about number four because four is a game changer and that is how to get everyone out of the woodwork to be at the table to develop this entrepreneurial ecosystem from like-minded individuals and really create this culture of entrepreneurship. There is so much hidden wealth in this 
region in Southeast Michigan, throughout the state, so many success stories. We don't celebrate them enough, but if, if there is a way to pull that out, it would really help all the other things, right? So is there anything that's uh, on the table yet that we're thinking about, about how to do that? Because that would be there, great. There's just one just thing, as a refresher, can we pull up the, yeah. the four? There's one thing, I think it's called Endeavor, and um, <laughs> that's kind of what we do. Uh, no, but in, in all seriousness, it's, it's a really long-term game. I think part of the conversation of like really the nomenclature and trying to divide in different spaces and look of different tactics of, of how to solve this, I think it's a big part. And then through our experience with Endeavor, it's really a long-term game. It really is. Like there are locations we've been around for 20 years, 20 plus years, and now you really see the, the snowball going by itself, right? It takes a lot of push. And, and I'd, be, I'd be really remiss if we didn't say that we're, we're very lucky and fortunate to have had the, the huge initial support of all of our board members and founding board members to start, like Cindy Paskey and Nate Lowry with the Voss family. But even, even very strongly and super important for us was the, the, the huge support we received from, from NEI at the time as well. And then um, William David's foundation that see what Endeavor kind of has done in, in other locations. Uh, and had chances to, to interact with Endeavor uh, in, in different settings uh, to try and bring this to, to Michigan and the region. Um, but it's a long-term game. We're, we're very, very, very early. We are in our startup. We are just leaving our startup phase maybe right now. Uh, with the launch of this report, I think this is where we're kind of really getting in the, in, in the game of, of having some influence, being able to, to drive the discussions at a different level. Um, yeah, I want to add to that. So I, I look, I think about your whole notion around storytelling, which I think is really important. So, you know, and I think of um, people like, you know, I mentioned Bill Picard or Leon Richardson or Andre Rush. You're right. We don't recognize and talk about these entrepreneurs and show their faces and their work enough so that we can see that even today. Cranes did a report in 2016. You know how they list all the different entrepreneurs. Do you know that minority and women entrepreneurs are about 15 billion in revenue a year in this region. Do you know who they are? Do you know what they look like? In addition to all the other entrepreneurs? So we are, we are actually embarking on a storytelling effort um, because we think that's really important. And the target, the audience is not you know, investors and national players. It really is a storytelling effort to show the profiles of entrepreneurs in our region of all colors, shapes, and sizes. You know that are high growth businesses or small businesses or tech businesses so that they can demonstrate that this is a community of opportunity for all people. So I think the storytelling is really important and you're right. I don't think we, we as a region do that enough to even show the diversity that we actually already have. You know, people get surprised, oh, you know, there's a woman entrepreneur that's successful, right? Yep. You know, there's a lot more than you think and they're contributing a lot to the economy already. Uh, in the back, and then we have, uh, Scott has a question in the front, and, oh, sorry, Don is in front of Scott, so, okay, we've got a queue, this is great. And there's a right. woman there, back there, too. <laughs> there we go. Uh, in the back. Th thanks for this. Uh, Omari Rush with uh, Hi, Omari. Source. Hi. Um, so, I guess I wonder uh, how general community members might get a sense of what scaling companies are and growing companies are in their communities. I mean, I, I suppose something like reading the paper helps, but what does it mean for um, any kind of um, uh, manager to say, I want to help out these companies, but I need to kind of have a sense about who to invest in hmm. outside of a, a kind of a, a bigger service provider or a, a larger company? Hmm. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. If I just want to make smarter and more th more um, thoughtful decisions yeah. about investing yeah. in um, in businesses that are yeah. scaling and growing, and mm -hmm. you know, how do I find those folks, and how do I think about? Uh -huh. can you, well, I think can you define. Go to, ahead. Can you just define invest? Are you talking really place capital, or you're talking like your time and skill and knowledge? Oh no, just like hire them or contract them or connect oh. mm -hmm. them with other people yep. or mm -hmm. just do the things, network them. Um, yeah. But yeah, how do I get to them and how to? That's how a great question. To get to us? I would ask that um, everyone in this room that has a portfolio of entrepreneurs that they're helping to stand up. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> you know, so 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 here are people in this yeah. room right now that have connections to a lot of these companies and they're working with them very closely. Uh, Antonio would stand up too, right? I mean, he's on the platform. Um, but my point is, I think starting, this is a 
crew response, but just even starting with maybe connecting and networking with some of these people in this room that are working every day supporting these entrepreneurs. And you can determine you know, what type of entrepreneur are you most interested in helping and investing in, because I guarantee you they're touching all types right here. Don, and I know Scott was uh, jumping up and down to get in on this, so Good old Don. Scott. Yeah, so real quick, with, I think it's a comment as much as a question. Um, somebody, I think it was Pam talked, Don Jones from New Economy Initiative. Um, Pam talked about um, leadership in sports, uh, about the thoughtful, uh, thoughtful and purposefulness and the long game of this. If you think about sports, that again, uh, Title IX is, uh, we're moving up on uh, probably 40 years, 50 years of Title IX, mm -hmm. 40 years, which, it was public policy that saying you must support women equally in your programming in sports um, if you are going to receive federal funding for that and people blanched at it and such like that. And today, women in sports and leadership and the things you see, whether it's in winter sports, summer sports, soccer, the list goes on, um, is, is significant. And that's because there was a purposeful, thoughtful, and long game uh, in terms of making sure that there was that participation. So I think the same thing's true here in what we're talking about with both the businesses but also the diversity of those businesses to represent our, our, is that we have to be purposeful, thoughtful, and a long game. This is not a three-year program or a five-year program or a 10-year program. As I said, Title IX is 40 years old and we're now seeing the, mm. the fruits of that. So I guess it's more of a comment than a question about uh, all of this staying with it mm -hmm. and not saying, well, this report really shows that some good things are happening, so now we're done and now we can move on to the next thing. So mm -hmm. I guess no question in there, just a comment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks, Don. Uh, right Scott, up here. please go to Scott. I know, I know I close let's, let's get you on the mic. There's bourbon. Okay, and just a clarification of time. How much, how much time? None. Just one minute. Oh, yeah, so okay. I, know, I know we're really close. So, hi, yes. I'm Scott Hippock. I'm the new CEO of the MIBA. And so what we launched... MIBA means... What's that? MIBA. MIBA, sorry, the Michigan Israel Bi uh, Business Accelerator. So, um, been around for about two years, 15 years with the MIBB, which was the bridge. The, uh, the, you asked a great question about the ability to see other organizations. And so, I think a lot of the conversation we're having here is, is how do we promote that clarity with the understanding of what's in the ecosystem? Uh, and, and, and how do we see these smaller organizations? I ran a business for 11 years. There was no way I had some connectivity to a larger organization. How did they find me? How did I see them? This platform that we have here in this conversation is all about, I think, the ability to promote that clarity. What we launched on the 20th of May is a, is a it's, it's called Startup Nation Cent Central, but it's really what it is. It's a partnership with Israel, and so the technical name of the website, and I have a couple flyers, is StartupMichigan.Tech. And what this platform is, is designed to do is to promote the clarity of sight from a small business to a VC or an angel investor, and it allows you to, to leverage existing technology that was developed in Israel that we frankly leveraged here in the US and we're the first state in the US to use that platform. So I, if you want a flyer, I'd be happy to provide it. We're encouraging our small businesses, our entrepreneurials, to uh, all those small, to come put their profile on this site so they can, one, be seen, and two, see other organizations to develop the partnerships so that fo so folks like Pam and others can also find them and then we can invest and, and truly build that par partnership and really uh, promote this ecosystem of what it means to, to grow with folks like Dan and MEDC and Fred. So, so I have some of these, I'd be happy, to, and it's free by the way, there's no, no cost to our entrepreneurial part partners, our large businesses, VCs, no cost, Scott. it's free. We're gonna, I, we're gonna, for the we're gonna close with one. We're gonna close with one more comment and then <laughs> just uh, 10 seconds or maybe one word from each of the panels, so. Oh. We're out of time. Okay, <laughs> Out of time. Uh, two, two seconds, two words. And, and, and. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it and, and so happy to be on the panel with some, some of my favorite people. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do believe this is a starting point, you know, to create awareness. And um, there is a real need for us to take startups, entrepreneurs, and scale-ups very seriously. But there's so much work that we can do. We can see incredible growth. And I think this report really, like I said before, gives us a starting point to really uh, be intentional about putting a stake in the ground and starting. Great. And that report can be found at endeavor.org slash SEMI. 
uh, dash C-A-E. So thank you all for coming. Thanks, Thanks to our guys. panelists. Um, thank you to the chamber.